able to order some things. I know some of you have given her money to be able to do something with that. And so if uh, we can get the rest of the school supplies in that you're going to bring this week, that would be great. And so we need to get that finished and going. It just keeps going, doesn't it? You know that's on purpose, right? <laughs> because we don't want you sitting around too long on any one thing. And uh, it just needs to keep going from one thing to the next. So we want to talk about being open in church. What does that really mean? And this is maybe the hardest one. Uh, open to the Spirit, open to God, all of those things are good, but open in church. I mean, really, what are people looking for? And if you're here just looking, we're glad you're here. Come in, sit, look around, talk to people, see what we do. We, we're just excited that you're here just to be a part of us. And so that's one of the good things. No problem with that. Come and just watch and see if you want to be part of this. But I find it amazing that uh, God would put a bunch of confessed sinners in one room and say, now you guys get along. Doesn't that seem odd to you? But somehow that's what he did. What, what was he thinking in the first place? I mean, that's almost a recipe to, for disaster had it not been for the grace of God, because that's the one thing that changes it all. So what are people looking for when they say, I'm looking for a church? And there's a lot of different things, but let me just give you a few. I saw this sign, the best pastor, the best sermons, the best programs and ministries, the best building and members, no offering. We have plenty of dollars. I'm not sure what they're advertising there. It's a perfect church that needs nothing, not even you. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure I recognize that as being a church, but I'd say that's definitely not us, okay? So the money you just gave, yes, that's all needed. We just finished vacation Bible school. Uh, we're about to do some more things, and so there's a lot of things that are going on. But here's what I think happens. People are looking for a place where they fit, a place where they can get along. First of all, in almost every person that has said, I'm looking for a church, they then begin to describe the place where they grew up. They're looking for a small church because I grew up in a small church. I'm looking for a bigger church because I grew up in a bigger church. And I don't know if we realize that or not, but a lot of the time, the thing we're looking for most is history. It's for where we have been. It's for where we were comfortable. It's where we met God. And so that's the thing we're looking for most is the place that's familiar and where we've already been. And if we could go back to where we were before, we would say, ah, this is the perfect place. I don't think God wants that. He doesn't want you just going back to a place in your history where you can sit down and say, okay, this is it. Second thing is convenience. I want it to be not far from my house, have a parking place that's very close, empty pews in the back on the aisle, right? <laughs> I mean, that's premium real estate there. And nobody sits in my place so that when I come in, I don't have to say, you're sitting in my place. I've been there for the last 10 years. Don't you know that? I want a place where people will listen to me, where I can have input, where they don't make any changes unless they ask me first. But I also want to be anonymous so that when I don't want you to know what I think, you don't have to ask. I want a, something that stays like it is. If it's an old church, an old church, a modern church, a modern church, none of this change stuff. But I want church people to be kind and generous and not gossips and not be petty and not always talking about me. It's okay if they're sinners, but just not sinners that are hypocritical. I want out and out sinners who are real sinners and they're not afraid. No fake sinners, okay? <laughs> Trying to pretend that they're really not, but they're here. And so if you're going to sin, then do it. No fake spirituality either. Because if you're going to be spiritual, I want to know that it's real. Not that it's just that you're putting it on. I want people who will follow the rules, but also people who forgive me when I break the rules. I want to be able to support good causes in the church with missions that they spend money well, 
so that when I donate, I know that this is going to somewhere good and that somewhere a hundred starving children are going to be helped. I want a church that is open and transparent and lets you see everything about it and lets you know everything about it, even though I'm probably not going to tell them anything about me. Yeah, I know that's an impossibility. One that's growing, that has lots of happy people, that has things happening, a place where I can help and not be in charge. I think that's what everybody wants is a place where I do not have to be in charge, but I can help. A place with a good reputation. It's been around for 100 years, but everything is new. It's cool. It has the latest equipment and decor, but it's very experienced and been there for, for a long time. Well, good luck. I, I don't know that you're going to find that, and I don't know that you would even want that if that possibility existed. So let's go back and look at what a good church is in the Scripture. Maybe that's really the first place where we need to go, is being able to look for what church looked like when church was good. Now, we always look at the beginning one, and that's not an exception today, but I don't want to just start at the very beginning, like day one, because I imagine there's a whole lot of things in there that were not told to us. And so we're going to start a little bit later, by the time they've been able to organize and by the time they've been able to put some stuff together and just being able to do some great things. So Phil has read to us about the number that believe they were one heart and one soul, the full number, all of those who believe. It's an amazing conclusion in how they felt about each other and how they acted and how they were toward each other. There's, there's this common goal. And you look at some of the markers that it gives you about what this means and you realize this is truly an unusual group. It says the possessions that they had, they didn't recognize as being theirs, but it was, it was everybody, whoever needs it. And so they were open in that way. They didn't claim anything as their own. They had everything in common. And that means everybody treats it like it belongs to them, like they're going to respect it, like they're going to deal with it well. They don't abuse things. They treat them like it matters. There's this great teaching that occurs and great respect for the authority of the teachers as the apostles came and taught. And they taught about the resurrection of Jesus and people were willing to learn and they came and they listened. And they were there because of resurrection. And then it says great grace was upon them all. Grace makes up for our lack. It takes away our sin. It makes up for our failure. It makes up when we are not able to perform like we should. Grace is a blessing when, when we deserve none. And it's the one that, that keeps on giving Grace is God giving to us when, when we don't deserve anything and God blessing us. And then it says there was not a needy person among them. Because the problem was created by them. There were a lot of people who had come for Pentecost and then stayed and then they didn't have a house. They didn't have anywhere to go. There wasn't another place there. And so here they are, and they don't have jobs now. So that because they didn't go back home, they stayed because, well, there's the new church. There's a new part of this. And people are so dedicated to church and to coming to church and being in church that they became in financial need. And it's because of church that all of these things happen. And so it says they took up collections so that there was not an easy, needy person among them. And I, we'll talk about this a little bit more. But I think there's several reasons for this. First, it says, you know, they didn't take advantage just saying, well, okay, I can always get money from church. Second, people gave to church. They took care of people. And third, they trusted people to deal with money at least for one more chapter. Because by the time you get to chapter five, you got somebody trying to make an impression. In chapter six, you've got widows and the money wasn't spent on the widows and they weren't getting the food that they needed. And so you get, yeah, it doesn't last long. But by the end of chapter four, this is an amazing church. If you ever get there and ever see that, appreciate it, because it is so 
fluid and so flexible that it just keeps going and going and going and going and going. And we try and have as many of the good times in there and as much of the good church as possible. But there is never a church that is static and says, okay, here we are, we have arrived, and we're going to stay right here. It just doesn't work that way. It is always constantly moving. Just think about yourself. The changes in opinions, the changes in the things that you've done, the changes in where you are, how much your kids have grown, how much your grandkids have grown. Nothing stays the same. And neither does church. And so we are trying to be on top of it. And to realize what God wants and what God sees done. Barnabas is the encourager. He's the one who has an extra piece of land. Please don't misread this passage. I know sometimes people want to turn this into a commune. Everybody sold all their houses and came and pooled the money. No, that is not what this says. It said he had an extra piece of land that was probably going to be for an investment somewhere else, maybe into his business, and he decided, I want to invest in church. And so he sold that piece of land and invested in church. And so he gave the money and just said, here. It wasn't earmarked. It wasn't told what to do. It was just a matter of, Here it is. You guys will know the need more than anyone else. And certainly the apostles knew that. And so he was willing to invest in it. And that's what you see is people like this. It's one of those things that's huge. And because it was something that he believed in because these people were very sincere. And there are times when everything comes together. So how did they get there? If it's always fluid... And if it's always in motion, then how did they get there? There's never a constant that you can say, okay, we're going to do this and it'll all be done right. It's a process. Everything is a process. And church is a process as much as anything else. If things are great right now, it's because a whole lot of things have gone on before that. If church is bad right now, it's because a whole lot of things have gone on before that. And, and you just know that. And so wherever you are, it's because of all the stuff that has been happening. So how did they get there? If you go back to the beginning of Acts and start looking at what the development was, that Jesus had just died and they had completely lost their direction. They weren't even sure they wanted to be disciples anymore. That's a great church, right? They went fishing. We're going to give up preaching. We don't even have a Savior anymore, and we're just going to go back to fishing. And then Acts 2 happens, and the Spirit is poured out, and you have the day of Pentecost. And they're faced with their own sin, that they had killed their own Messiah. But they find the grace of God because of their repentance and their baptism and the Spirit being poured out upon them. And, and they gather together. It says God added them to himself and to each other. And so that's one of the things you see. They were added as they were being saved. And so the forgiven and the redeemed and the new kingdom and the spiritual bond. And they go out and find more people. And then they go out and find more people. And then they go out and find more people. And so that's one of the things you see. In Acts 3, there's a lame man who's been healed. He'd been sitting there by the gate for a long time. And Peter and John are going into the temple. He's healed. And everybody sees it. And everybody notices it. And there's a lot of commotion about this. He was one of the needy, by the way. And so it was, says there was not a needy one among them. He was no longer a needy one among them because they healed him, right? And so they solved the issue of needy people by getting to the core of what the need was. It was not just a constant distribution, but they were able to heal whatever the core problem was. And so not being a needy person among them is fantastic. I'm not sure we're capable of doing that today. If we could heal everything, then that would be great. But 
not really sure we have that capability all the time to get at the core. But that's what happened. And so they had healed him and things were great and uh, wonderful and not so much. Because in Acts chapter 4, it says, As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening, and many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. And so there's two things going on at once. They're teaching and they're, they're informing people about what Jesus has done. And the passage before it talks about they were preaching Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. Now it's in Jesus, your resurrection from the dead. A little bit of a more personal message here. A little bit of a change in what it says about them. And they didn't like it, so they arrested them. Threw him in prison. Maybe we can stop it that way. They're trying to make control of this. And so they faced a lot of hardship and a lot of difficulty and some persecution. And this is the background of what happened and how they got there. They have very definite enemies that stand against God. And they are there to destroy them. But some people who heard them believed because they have great courage. And they saw their courage, and they saw that they could stand, and they saw that they had been with Jesus, and they said, man, I want to have courage like that. I don't want to be pushed around by the council. And so you see that developing as well. Down in verse 18, they bring them out, and they say, we don't want you teaching anymore. And they called them, and they charged them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. And then Peter and John answered, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They're saying this was real. And we cannot be quiet about it. It really happened and we cannot ignore it. We have got to tell this story. And so they stood in opposition to other people who were trying to silence them. But they knew they had seen it. They knew they had heard it. They knew it was real. And when you're threatening me, I'm going to speak anyway. You see, they're suffering for what they believe. And they're not going to back down. And there's nothing they can really do to them because they didn't really commit a crime. I mean, they will later. And they release them. And when they released them, they went to their friends because their friends had been praying about them being put in prison because this looks like, okay, this could be the end. I mean, it's bad enough the Savior dies and now let's take out two apostles. Well, but no, they did release them. And the prayer is very interesting because the prayer says, God, we recognize this may be from you. This persecution and whatever has happened can be from you. And whatever difficulties we face, we recognize that you're in this position and you have put us in this position and we know you're going to bring glory out of it and we're willing to be the pawns. We're willing to stand there and say, God be glorified even in my death. It's a fight of their life because people are wanting to destroy them. But they had this idea that they could change the world, that God was depending on them. Do we feel like God's depending on us to change the world? Well, maybe that's not a fair question, or is it? Do you want a church like this? Because that's where church comes from. And then the conclusion in chapter 4 of what happened. As their prayer continues, they're praying that God will do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. 
while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. That's an incredible passage. That's a powerful church. Because of what they're doing, the prayers in their life, God has a plan. They believed in God's plan. They see their life as being part of God's plan. And God is doing this. The reason we sit here this morning is God wants us here in these pews singing these songs. Great job, Justin. That was really good today. You guys sounded great. New songs, always trying to look for something else, new ways to praise God a common goal of spreading the gospel and being able to say this is what we're doing. And so today when we have church, a lot of theirs was because of spiritual reasons, because of the resurrection of Jesus. It's the same here today, unless you look at that first list. The first list that I gave you of what people are looking for had no spiritual reasons at all. But really, that's where we are, isn't it? So when we have church, it looks kind of like this. Lots of confusion, lots of things going on, sometimes odd things happening. Uh, we don't have an enemy the same way, but we have an enemy. We have a really strong enemy. And our enemy is in encouraging acceptance and tolerance and everything else and I think that becomes our enemy because then we're afraid to speak and we don't want to say anything wrong why don't we just tolerate all the sin in the world is there any reason to be saved isn't everybody saved let's just put John three sixteen at a football game no I think there's more to it than that isn't it I don't want to be that we do have Jesus. We do have spiritual things. And being an open to churches and open with people, it's got to be one of the hardest things. Let me just give you a little practical advice. I mean, we come and we ask for repentance, and people will often confess their sin, and that's great. But then that sin is gone, right? You don't have to confess it over and over again. And be careful when you do this, because I think sometimes we want to dump a lifetime of not just sin, but of problems and difficulties and things that are hard to overcome on somebody and go, okay, now what? They probably can't handle all that. So maybe you want to share a little bit at a time of what people can handle, because you spend a whole lifetime gathering all of that. And Boy, just to dump that all on one person, they, they can't even absorb it or imagine it. We understood it one day at a time, and sometimes we can put overload on each other. I think if Joseph or Paul or David, any of them had been revealed, here's going to be what your life is like, they would have quit. And said, I don't want to live anymore. But we can do a whole lot of things one day at a time one piece at a time that maybe we can't do when everything's together. So be careful with each other. Don't give people more than what they can handle, but also at the same time realize that that's what we're here for, is to get rid of things, to be able to go on from things, not just to say in this constant rut and the same turmoil of, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm. No, somewhere in here, this process gets us to holy, gets us to God, gets us to worship, gets us to be what we're supposed to be, to make progress in our life. Not a needy person among them means they solved the core problem. They didn't have it anymore. They went on to something else. Well, I'm not sure we have the capacity of doing that in some cases. It is a matter of being able to gain greater spiritual growth. See, it's not just a matter of confessing sins to one another. And by the way, that's the way it says, confess sins to one to another. That sounds more like one-on-one -on -one than it does, let's all 
talk about it. It's more a confession of Jesus as Lord. It's Jesus being over us all. And we need people who can suffer for Jesus because that's what they did. People who are able to work for Jesus because that's what they did. People who are able to share spiritual things because that's what they did. People who are able to share physical things because that's what they did. People who are able to see the big picture and not get caught in all the details about who did what and all the little bitty things. But that we are about the work of God and that we are doing the things of God. And so when you're open in church, it can be one of the most devastating things ever. Because very often you're going to get a whole lot of criticism. I'm open about my life and wow, here it all comes. Or it can be one of the most great, gracious things ever. Because there are people of grace, fine people of grace that are able to do that and able to heal. One heart, one soul. That's where we want to be. A place where we take care of each other as much as we can. And we may not have capacity to do it all, but we want to do that as much as we can. Where we follow God, where worship is important and we're serious about it. Where we follow the Bible, we learn from it. It's not just a matter of opinions or keeping up with culture. It's a matter of what the Bible said. Where we get along. And as long as you don't mess up, we'll be fine. Well, okay, maybe I have to do some things too. Where we can say we're sorry when we messed up. Where it's humility and not hypocrisy. Where grace is extended Sometimes even when we can't admit that we did anything wrong, still extend grace. Where things are expected. We expect you to be a good spouse, husband or wife. That's kind of written in there. We expect that. It's not a matter of just doing whatever you want. We expect you to raise your children. We don't expect us to raise your children. We expect you to raise your children, but we join together in doing it. And so we have lots of opportunities of teaching that can go on, of fellowship that can go on, of relationships that are able to be done. But, you know, there's one thing that's extremely, extremely important. You got to show up. Because none of it matters if you don't show up. And if your kids never make it to Bible class, they don't get anything. And then it's all on you. And by the way, come five minutes early, ten minutes early, because they're trying to check kids in now. And your kids want those Bible bucks. And so you got to be able to get them here early in order for them to earn all of those things. And they will be more excited about it. Don't let your kids miss out on that. Let them be part of that. Let them be in all of this. This is part of what happens. This is who we are. And if you don't show up for it, don't blame church. It makes deeper relationships when we can work together. I don't ever want to be part of a church that expects nothing. Really? Because God is moving, because God is doing things, I want to believe and depend on other people. Because God is alive and God is in us and God is working. And it begins, first of all, with our forgiveness and with our grace that has been given to us. Because if you don't know that and if you don't feel that, it's real hard to give it to somebody else. And so let me just ask this morning, do you have grace from God that you know that you've forgiven because you've repented of sins and been baptized into Christ, and then church life starts. But until you do that, until you say, I'm a member, I'm all in, I'm part of the group, it doesn't begin. There was not a needy person among them. It was not an outreach. It wasn't the whole community. It wasn't all of Jerusalem. It says among them, and over and over again it refers to among them and the passages of them and who they were. People today don't seem to want to do that or join or be part of things, but boy, that's essential. 
for what God's plan is to be part and to join in and accept the challenge and the expectation because that's when God delivers. Everything can be overcome because of the death of Jesus. Everything. And if the death of Jesus can't overcome, then the problem's us. You see, church is whatever we make it. Because it is us. It is the people of God working with Him. And we want you to be here. We want you to be working with us. Because we are trying to have the things God wants done, done by us, done here. And there's a lot of people who are trying to accomplish that. We just have our corner of the world. But that's what it means to be open in church, to say, I will be part of things. I will be in it. I will extend grace. I will have relationships. I will trust. I will worship. And we let our heart change. Because that's how God uses us. Maybe today you haven't seen that. But I'm just going to ask you to be open. We're in church. Can you be open about what's going on in your life or about what you need or about your sin? Boy, if we can help you get closer to God and be part of this.